this panel called Sao Paulo Beyond the Future of Internet Governance. Today we'll be talking about the global uh, internet governance space, what's at stake, and in particular this upcoming meeting in Sao Paulo in a few weeks time, um, April 23rd, 24th, that will be discussing the future of internet governance. So we have a, a lot of panelists here and not very much time, so I think we'll just uh, jump right in. But we really intend for this to be an open discussion with questions from the audience, from those uh, following remotely. Um, so please do feel free to jump in. The first uh, presenter will be jo uh, Joana Barón from FGBCTS in Brazil. Joana is a researcher on internet governance and human rights issues, and will be opening to set the stage for what's going on in Brazil, how did we get here, what are the, some of the, uh, the national context the issues going on in Brazil that might impact this meeting, and um, you know what we can expect to, to get from it. Okay, we'll there. Um, i just give you a quick uh, overview about the goals and the idea of this meeting. Um, it started um, with, uh, after our president uh, made a speech at the UN General Assembly, she reinforced some principles that were developed in a multi-stakeholder way uh, in our Internet Steering Committee, CGIBR. And after that discourse, in, um, Fadi, the CEO from ICA, uh, had a meeting with Dilma and they came up with this idea of this event. It's a diplomatical event and it's going to be more stakeholder as well, so people can express their interest to come in the platform here until the 8th of March. And, and on the 15, uh, invitations will be sent. So far, uh, we have some numbers um, on the expressions of interest. Uh, so far, uh, private sector and civil society uh, are the, the, the ones that have been uh, posting submissions. The goal is to have some balance here, so government uh, represented governments are are being invited as well through our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So this uh, <coughs> show exactly the invitations from government because it's uh, still very little government. It's um, uh, 14%. Uh, but those invitations are being sent, and this data is going to be updated. Uh, governments will be able to bring uh, two. Uh, representatives per country or three if a uh, high level uh, representative is coming. The goal of the meeting is to address two tracks, one on principles of internet governance and the other one on thinking about the, um, the roadmap for the evolution of, um, of, of the ecosystem for internet governance. And here in the platform, uh, until the 8, people can also submit uh, ideas on these two tracks. Uh, among us, with civil society, we have prepared contributions, uh, particularly in, in the principles we, we have been uh, proposing uh, that the many letters and sets of principles that exist, among them we have been highlighted uh, highlighting the, the ones that have a uh, major background on, on human rights and I think Anya will talk more about the kinds of things we are pushing on, on the reform for the, the framework. This, I think this event is important because now we live in a, in a we are living in a gap in, in which became evident during the weekends in Dubai, that meeting uh, convened by the ITU. Uh, on 2012, and then after Snowden uh, revelations. Uh, it, it was clear that some developing issues, some fundamental rights are not being uh, addressed by the current ecosystem, and I think the goal of this meeting is, is to uh, get this debate going outside of the UN framework, so it's even more free to, to innovate. So I think it's a good opportunity to change the status quo in which we are living now. 
Thanks, Joanna. And can you also speak just a bit about, in Brazil, the national framework, um, this piece of legislation that will be dealing with a lot of the same issues on a national level, the Marco Civil, and what the interplay you see as being between the national deliberations around that and the international um, meeting that's happening in just a few weeks? Yes. So in Brazil, we have been debating our what's called Marco Civil. It's uh, being called as our constitutional constitution for internet, uh, the civil rights framework for the web, and it was inspired by those principles that uh, the president mentioned at the UN General Assembly. And but this bill was drafted in a public consultation, and all this debate started in, in 2009. So and so far, it's in the the Congress and have, haven't been voted, so it's pretty much a soap opera. Every every week we think it's going to be voted and then it's not. So as as the president has highlighted the importance of, of these principles for this event, respected at least before the event we have a Marcus view uh, that really endorses these principles at the, in the national level. So I hope it also puts pressure on that. If it doesn't happen, it would be a bit of a shame and complicated as well for the president to not have this view in the national level. Thanks, Joanna, for setting us up with the basics on the meeting. I think at this point we could move to Anya Kovac, who is the director of uh, Internet Democracy Project in India, who can speak a little bit more about what's on the table in Brazil, what are the issues that are being discussed. From a civil society perspective, what are some of the priorities that that actors in that field are looking to achieve in the beginning. Uh, thanks, Deborah. And it's good to be here and have this conversation and this kind of meeting as well. Um, there's two big issues on the table in uh, Brazil. One is the development of a set of principles that would be the foundation for um, internet governance at the global level and then hopefully at some point feed into the uh, national level in various countries as well. Um, and the second one is um, the an attempt to develop a roadmap for the evolution of internet governance. And in a way, as Joanna said, both of these um, issues kind of build on the debate that perhaps became most visible first in the wicket. In some ways, I think the camps that will be visible in Brazil will also still reflect the camps in the wicket, in the sense that there we saw very clearly some governments, mostly from the West, that didn't really want the current ecosystem to change, and other countries uh, mostly from the development, uh, developing world who did want to change. The exact nature of that change, I don't think they all agreed on. At the moment, we have proposals on the table to have, for example, one new um, UN body that would actually be responsible for policy making as well as coordination and also for the development of principles. Um, but that's only one model. So you have these two broad camps, and in a way, uh, those are likely to come back uh, to Brazil as well. Um, what I found interesting here, because I think in, in this particular venue there's a lot of people who feel quite worried about that debate happening in the first place, and uh, the question I think I was asked more often here is, uh, but isn't it really bad if the ITU is going to take over? And I think, first of all, I don't think an ITU takeover is really um, on the on the agenda right now. What is on the agenda is a question that perhaps we need a place where certain issues that aren't addressed yet will be addressed. And some people would suggest the ITU. Um, another thing I thought was really striking in the meeting was that the role of business in shaping the internet in ways that doesn't always benefit users. In this particular event, I didn't see that very strongly. Well, for example, in India, that's very much on the agenda of civil society as well. Um, and I think these kind of these two issues, the tension of how beneficial is government control or not, and how what is that exactly the role of business in evolving the current ecosystem, are actually the big drivers behind the debates that will take place in, in Brazil. What we try to do as civil society is kind of not to subscribe to either of these two camps, but to look at these big questions and to also look in more detail at what is exactly missing um, in the current ecosystem as it exists and what is it that really needs to change. And one thing that I think many of us agreed on is that 
there are certain issues that aren't sufficiently addressed. And the question does raise then, who is, who needs to take that work forward? And who is then going to make the assessment in the first place of whether or not an issue is addressed sufficiently? So one of the issues, the things that uh, some of us in civil society, uh, including under a grouping called Best Bits, have proposed, is to actually introduce a new body, uh, possibly within the UN system, that would do precisely that exercise, make, make a map of the current ecosystem, look exactly at who deals with what, assess where there are real gaps, and then make recommendations on how specific issues can be taken forward. Um, I think it's really important to see that there are alternative proposals possible. I do think, since the week that actually the debate has evolved quite a lot, I don't think that always comes out enough in the media. We've made one set of alternative proposals, but there are others, and so we hope in that way that Brazil will be a really important uh, nuancing of the debate that is existing at the moment. Um, as part of that exercise, I think we also need to ask some really difficult questions which proponents of the multi-stakeholder system at the moment often try to avoid. Um, we all agree that there isn't one definition of multi-stakeholderism, but that isn't really good enough an argument in the sense that we do need to specify a little bit more, at least according to different processes, what is it uh, that we mean in a particular process by multi-stakeholderism, how do these processes overlap with particular issues, and we probably also need to start developing more principles around um, when is it just about participation, when is it about representation, and if it is about representation, then what are criteria that people who participate in that process need to fulfill, especially from, say, business, civil society, when you actually speak on behalf of others then clearly certain guidelines should already be into place, or we are evolving into a system where those with the most money and the most time, so those who are able to participate, will actually set the rules. I think that is a, kind of really feeds into the second part of the agenda. I think I've mostly been speaking about the roadmaps so far, but so the development of principles is very much on the agenda there as well. Uh, part of that is about substantive principles. We see that the nature of the internet that's so empowered, has been empowering for people is increasingly undermined in a variety of ways. And to actually have a global agreement on some of the substantive things that need to be put into place to make sure that we hold on to that empowering of potential is really important. So things like interoperability, network neutrality, uh, open standards, etc. But there is also the whole question of process principles. And that's another thing that uh, Brazil will be working on looking at the questions of governance, uh, inclusiveness, transparency, accountability, um, and perhaps, I think increasingly, perhaps we need to start pushing it a little bit further and even say, maybe principles aren't enough, maybe we should actually move towards something like a constitution for internet governance, where we enshrine some of these principles in a slightly more binding fashion, and also develop the rules for multi-stakeholderism uh, in a more binding fashion. But to make sure that it is a system that really contributes to uh, social and economic development, human rights, and social justice. I leave it for you for now. Thanks, Anya. I think you did a great job of setting up what's on the table in Sao Paulo. And let's be clear, it's a two-day meeting. One, probably half of the day is going to be sort of ceremonial things, and that's a lot for a, lot for a day and a half, basically, of working time. So it's quite clear that these are ongoing issues that will be evolving um, in debates at the UN and other venues as well. And excuse me. And um, just to show that this isn't happening in isolation, there's a, a number of different internet governance events that will be happening this year or next year that were already planned before Sao Paulo. Uh, Joanna, if you could um, pull up the screen. On the screen, we have a list of that, um, those different events that are happening. And I was thinking maybe Ben, uh, ben Doctor can go next to speak more about sort of the larger context, what are the ongoing issues that maybe Sao Paulo can help move beyond, but um, also kind of bring the larger vision in. And to introduce Ben Wagner from <coughs> the Senior Fellow with the Annenberg, Annenberg School of Communication at University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, so to follow on just on what has been said here already, um, to, before I say all of this, um, I think I should preface it all by saying that um, I'm really grateful for the hard work and energy and dedication that all of the, um, the, the 
people in both in Brazil and elsewhere in the world and civil society put into this meeting. And uh, what I'm about to say is not to detriment that too much. Um, but I think a lot of the conversations that are starting now basically started two years ago. And you mentioned the, the wicket and essentially this conversation, would it really be so bad if the ITU took over? Which is a, a big, uh, a big <coughs> elephant in the room. And to be honest also, uh, in my context, it's a little bit personal because two years ago, I was at one of these uh, Google organized events in DC and spoke about that at the time and wondered afterwards why on earth I was saying a lot of the things I was saying. Because um, I'm serious, at the time there was a, a large group of the academic, technical, civil society community which all thought, oh, this ITU thing, it's awful and we need to make sure that whatever it is, it doesn't happen. And that's also linked to uh, funding issues of certain groups, but that basically comes down to, at the end of the day, a, uh, a broad debate which disagreed with the ITU doing what it was supposed to be doing. And I think many of us have come out of that debate and wondered why the things that were said were actually said at the time. And Brazil is, if you will, a little bit of more of a nuanced response to that debate than the initial, oh god, this is terrible, the IT needs to stop doing what it's doing, and this is going to end. At the same time, it hasn't still resolved a lot of the very basic issues that exist. So while it's very nice that the internet is able to provide for human rights and outcomes that are extremely important in many parts of the world, it also doesn't just provide for that, it provides for many other things then nobody's really even remotely begun to solve the legitimacy question. So nobody can tell me why it's legitimate that in parts of Uganda, Google gets to make all sorts of decisions rather than a local group or rather than any other group for that matter. Why we essentially have private corporations making decisions about human beings' lives in many different parts of the world. And that's just a huge legitimacy question, how that can be reasonable. The other side of that is the big problem which is the multi-stakeholder model that nobody really wants to acknowledge, which is that not just that it's hugely problematic and we haven't agreed on what it means or what it is or what it's supposed to be, but that it gives power to specific groups that otherwise wouldn't have it. And power is basically to the business community, to the technical community, and to civil society. We would not otherwise have that level of power in these discussions if it weren't for the fact that the multi-stakeholder model apportioned this kind of international power, not just to states, but also to other actors. And so there's at least a burden of proof for all of the individuals involved in this model. If we're going to say that multi-stakeholder is wonderful, we at least need to acknowledge in the process that our voices are being heard in a way that no one else would otherwise care about. And that's an important thing to consider in the context of multi-stakeholderism. Why are companies even at the table? Because the multi-stakeholder model said they're there to be there. Would it be appropriate for um, Ford Motor Companies, Boss, to be sitting at the congressional regulation table to decide how seatbelts are made. In certain contexts, that might be reasonable. In other contexts, it might not be reasonable. The same question about civil society. In other contexts, they might be invited as experts. The same thing for people like me. How can people like us justify even being in the room and having a voice? Now, there are perfectly good reasons why that may be the case. But the burden of proof of the justification is on the people who are going into the room. It's not there by some abstract reason of, well, we represent some internet community because we're important and we care. There has to be more than that, and there has to be more of a justification for the legitimacy of the multi-stakeholder model if anybody's really going to take it seriously. And that, I guess, brings me to my final point, which is that the, the whole debate about these issues seems to be entirely devolved, uh, entirely devolved away from and devoid of geopolitics. Why should we be having this conversation right now and not having conversations about what's going on in the Ukraine? Unless there are serious reasons why there might not be other issues that are also geopolitically relevant and that also might have consequences for human beings' lives, it's very difficult to make the argument why either a government or a civil society group for that matter or a company should care about it unless there's a real geopolitical context in which it makes sense and in which it's appropriate because it will again change human beings' lives. So I think there's a twofold argument that needs to be made both on the legitimacy question, why is this a reasonable model and how can it be developed? But also, why does it matter enough to spend so much energy and time and emotions and also like, the, the huge amount of efforts that's going into organizing a conference like this? And they said, actually changes people's lives. Why should people care? Can I actually put one of your, your points back to you and say, how would you legitimize this model? How would you, or delegitimize it, but how would you find legitimate representation in internet governance policy? And given that this, is, this meeting's happening outside the UN, not in a typical nation state, and echoes occupied NGO fashion, that there's an opportunity to move beyond that and find creative solutions and bring new voices in and new models. So 
do you see Sao Paulo as an opportunity to advance and to come to some some understanding of, of how to bring this model forward, or do you see other opportunities in the future? So yes and no. Um, again, I'm an academic, I'm a political scientist, and so in part I think it's great that all of the sort of the, the effort and energy is going in, and there do seem to be new perspectives. At the same time, to be perfectly honest, when I look at the room of the people who are engaged in Sao Paulo, I see the same faces who've been having these conversations for the last five years. And the, the ability to not just bring new voices in and new faces, but also people who would otherwise not care about these issues, but care about it because they realize that it's having some impact on their lives for whatever reason. That's the challenge. I don't, I don't sadly have a, a silver bullet that will solve all of the issues, and I think there's a, a value to long term commitment on all of this. But there is a, a certain difficulty when you have a small club of usual suspects, which are also present in Sao Paulo, not just, and it's a, it's a classic problem. It's how do you create legitimacy from a group of people that are trying to create legitimacy? You always end up relying on the people who are already there. And so as a result of that, of course, to a certain degree, you need to include them. The question is then, how do you include them in a way that still allows other people to come in, but then also to structure it in a way that you're not just creating some kind of a model that perpetuates itself? Because if you look around you at the people who've been part of these internet con governance conversations for the last five, ten years, how many new faces have there really been? Hey, on that note, um, I will turn to Johan Halleberg from the government of Sweden, <laughs> who has been a, a strong voice in, in internet governance debates, um, often talking about human rights and bringing in that perspective to the debate, and I'm wondering if if Johan can provide us with his perspective on Sao Paulo and beyond, what are the bigger issues coming up in the next the next few years and what the position of, of the government of Sweden is on these matters? Thanks very much. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how to interpret that. I'm, am I in face or have I been around too long? <laughs> um, so I'll just leave that question for someone else to, to pick up, maybe. Um, these, um, these comments that have been made already um, are, are, are very pertinent and very, very good. I don't really have uh, a lot to add on, on, on those. Um, I think uh, to us, uh, we engage quite, quite heavily in discussions on internet governance. Uh, to us, this is an important issue um, for some of the reasons that have been mentioned here. Um, we are proponents of a multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. We would like that to remain the way in which the internet develops. Uh, we, we still believe that it is thanks to a very limited <coughs> amount of government involvement and regulation that the internet has provided everything that it, it provides to people. And it includes, of course, as you know, economic growth, but also development in all facets. Uh, political development, and personal participation, freedom of expression, etc. So we, we believe that this, this free, free model of development of the internet should, should, be, should be there, it should still be the way um, to, to guide the internet in the future. So that's why we are engaging ourselves a lot in, in internet governance. We are a small, a small government, uh, limited resources, so we're stretching ourselves to, to be able to, to go to different meetings and participate as much as we can. Um, and I can, I can confirm that in, in our administration, the issues of, of internet freedom and security and governance have been quite mainstream, actually, uh, in in our administration. Um, I would guess that there is not there is not one one embassy, one Swedish embassy abroad that is not aware of the importance of these issues, and it's it's very high on on the agenda of our our embassies and also other ministries. Um, and this is a, this is an exercise in itself to be able to coordinate between ministries and agencies. Um, and this takes time. I think in, in that respect it's good to be a, a small government, a small administration, uh, but still it's, it's, not, it's not without a great deal of effort that we, we engage in this. We've decided to um, uh, engage in the Brazil meeting um, actively. We have submitted a couple of days ago our, uh, our proposal for um, the principles part of the discussion. Um, I, I tweeted about them this morning and you'll find them on, on the home page of, of the, the Net Mondial meeting. Um, so if you're interested in, in looking at how we view the principles, uh, please go ahead and have a look. You will find that 
much of what is in our submission, our proposal, has already been said. And this echoes very much with what, what Anya and Ben have said. We've had these discussions for a long time. I think we agree pretty much on the basics. Uh, for those of you who come from Europe, you will also recognize that many of these principles have been formulated already in the Council of Europe. Uh, Council of Europe, 47 member states, uh, agreed on a set of principles for internet governance already two, three years ago. And we believe those principles are still valid. Um, and they, they include issues on security, universality, diversity, multi-stakeholderism, and importantly, human rights and the rule of law as well. I agree that we need to talk about what is multi-stakeholderism. We need to uh, be able to maybe define and further discuss how uh, the best way of, of providing a multi-stakeholder system actually uh, looks like. To us, it's not about a revolution um, of, of the multi-stakeholder system. We would rather like to see it strengthened. Um, when it comes to issues such as uh, internationalization of ICANN, it's something that, that we support. We think, it's, we think this idea is, is interesting. Uh, we would like to, to continue to discuss how, how this should be, uh, should be done, how it should be developed. Having said that, we basically uh, have no major issues with the system as it is today. But we also we are concerned that many countries around the world, they have issues with this. So it's in that context that we are willing also and, and able to discuss the future of ICAP and its role uh, in the internet governance system. I think it's, it's really difficult to see what's going to happen after Sao Paulo. We have um, a swath of different meetings that are taking place and different processes. Uh, they're about human rights, they're about internet governance, they're about cybersecurity. It's about application of international law in cyberspace. There are various tracks that somehow uh, are not really related, but they interlink. So it's really difficult to think at this point to say what's, what's going to happen. Obviously the Busan meeting and the penitentiary meeting of, of the ITU will be one such important meeting. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that it's, it's, it's going to be hard to predict how exactly um, the relationship with Sao Paulo and, and the ITU is going to, 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 uh, to play out. Uh, I'm not sure. I think we just have to continue to engage, and um, we agree with what was said that this the meeting in Sao Paulo is a, is an interesting initiative, and uh, I think it's applaudable that we can now talk about these things from from both a principled manner and also in a in a forward-looking manner. That, that's good. I don't think it's the last meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Johan. And on that note, I think I will move on to Patrick Ryan, who is Senior Counsel for Free Expression and International Relations at Google, to give another perspective on, you know, what beyond the current frameworks, beyond the current um, debates we're having on Sao Paulo, where are the where are the big issues coming up in the next few years, and how do we move past this stalemate that we're seeing on some of these issues like the role of government, what is multi-stakeholders and legitimacy? Thank you. I'm glad that we started out the discussion and we can continue to talk about this in the context of the ITU. The World Conference of International Telecommunications was, for me, just an absolutely fascinating experience. Um, I was there as a, as a private sector delegate. In order to be in the room, you need, you need to be there as part of a government delegation, and that experience was second to none. Um, and not saying it was, a, it was a fabulous way to make policy, but the experience was really quite a you know, quite, quite, quite something. And now getting back from, um, from Dubai, we all sort of, uh, I think the community in general, sort of had this shock and said, what is it that just happened? Was the conference a success? Was the conference a failure? And there's still a lot of different opinions about that, you know, the evaluation of whether the conference was a success or failure. And I know in my case, it's, it's something that, that's, that, that really has troubled me. I sat down with, uh, with uh, Vid Surf and, and Max Singus uh, shortly after the event, we, we had a few different conversations about this, and of course Vid comes at this from a very technological perspective, one of the you know, pioneers of the internet, 
And so we set out to try to explain partially what happened in, in, in Dubai through the lens of, uh, of, of how engineers might look at them at the problem. And engineers, uh, there's a lot of different ways to sort of to sort of present the internet, but one of the fascinating ways that I think is very useful in presenting the internet is through the layered model. And there's we can debate how many layers there are, but uh, generally at the bottom of the layered model you have an infrastructure layer that deals with things like um, you know, the connectivity of the tubes, the pipes, the uh, you know spectrum. And then there's a content layer on top of that where matters of, uh, of, of free expression are often dealt with. And then there's on, on top of that a layer, we'll call it the social layer, which involves matters of trust and identity. Um, and the contribution that, that, we, that we had after, after thinking about this is trying to map the different institutions that are involved in internet governance. Some of them are multi-stakeholder, some of them aren't. Uh, there's their different degrees, but where do they fit in the layered model? And this helped us understand, at least offered an explanation that we found very satisfying for why the Wicked was such a problem. Because what happened in Wicked was a, an organization that's 150 years old. The International Telecommunication Union has been around for a very long time. And it's been working primarily in the infrastructure layer. And they've done a fabulous job in promoting infrastructure around the globe for that, for that period of time. There's, I'm not going to say that it's fabulous in all respects, but it has really been very effective in that, in that sense. The problem was when in Dubai, the International Telecommunication Union, it wasn't even necessarily the International Telecommunication Union itself, but the many member states that are part of it, used that event to get up into the other layers. In other words, rather than working on policy matters in the infrastructure layer, um, the biggest problems arose with the proposals that were in the content and social layer or the aspects of the logical layer, like the like, like I can. And so I think this is going to be one of the great challenges for the future, and I think this is where Brazil fits in, is, is figuring out how to, um, how to engage with the different layers of the internet at the appropriate place. Uh, the, the ITU has a perfectly reasonable place to, to exist in the future, in the very long term, in the infrastructure layer, in policy, coordination of, of satellite slots, that kind of thing. Like, but when you get up into the content layer, and particularly the social layer, there's work to be done. Um, and it's not so clear who the, you know, who the actors are or how to engage in them. And there's a multiplicity of actors. The Council of Europe is part of that space. The Internet Governance Forum is part of that space. And we need to work on those in order, in order to improve them. But uh, I hope that we can continue to think about this in, a, in, a, in that mapping context in order to figure out how to, uh, how to engage uh, in, the, in those upper layers effectively. Because that way, it doesn't become a discussion around the <coughs> ITU taking things over. Because the ITU is going to be there forever in that, and hopefully they'll stay, you know, primarily focused in the area that they do the best, where they're, as we say, you know, stick to their meaning what they what they do best. Now, when it comes to Brazil, uh, I think we're in a dangerous moment right now, and one that we should all hopefully start to think about: um, well, how do we define success or failure in Brazil? Um, if we define, I'm concerned that if we define success. As, as coming out with a global universal set of principles, I think we might fail. Not because we shouldn't strive towards that, but that uh, I think it's probably unlikely that the, the diverse group of, of, of participants in that are going to actually agree on a universal set of principles, um, or even a universal roadmap. And that's okay, because we're constantly We've been debating principle setting and roadmaps ever since the internet has, has started. Um, I don't know that a constitutional, I used to talk about a constitutional moment as well, and, and, I'm, and I'm starting to think that that may not be the right way to go because uh, if you think about the way things are in the constitutional setting, in other words, governmental constitutions, they're constantly in flux and constantly being changed. In the United States, where we're a constitutional environment, we didn't give women the right to vote until 100 years ago. Right. So there are fundamental things that are always in, in, in flux and evolve, in, in, in changing in, 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 in constitutions around the world. And if we um, set that bar so that we're expecting this outcome to happen in Brazil, I think we're going to fail. But it's okay if we can help identify where some of those areas of disconnect are. In other words, if we can reach a point where we now know a little bit better what the areas of principles are that we can agree on and where we're in disagreements, that itself is a fairly significant accomplishment. Thank you, Patrick. I'm hearing from some of my fellow panelists here that they have questions.
for each other. So I'm just going to open it up. I think uh, Ben and uh, Joanna had some questions. Sure, I just wanted to ask a question to Patrick directly. When we're looking at the Brazilian meeting, would you say that ICANN or Google have greater control over the internet? <laughs> and if so, if it's possible that Google has more control over the internet than ICANN, why are we spending a whole meeting in Brazil discussing ICANN's control of the internet when um, the constitutional moment has nothing to do with them and not more to do with you guys? Well, I, I don't know that the Brazil meeting is about ICANN. Particularly, I mean, it certainly isn't on the agenda that was just presented. It was the principles and roadmap wasn't about ICANN, it wasn't about Google, it wasn't about any particular entity. But you're right to be concerned. Uh, you're, the, what you said earlier about this idea of any actor in any space that, that exercises undue influence is a problem, and that's something that needs to be addressed. And that that that, that you know that that's certainly our case, and it's the case of any organization that's involved in the internet. We need to have checks and balances and a form of accountability for everybody's actor, everybody's participation in, 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 the, um, in the internet to make sure that they're responsible actors. Can I maybe also respond to that? Because I don't think it's an either or, right? It's not about is I can the problem or is business the problem. I think both of them are a problem. For me, the, the larger issue here, the larger, yeah. The larger issue here is, I don't think uh, uh, any decisions will be made in Brazil, but where I think this meeting can be really useful, and what I think sh it should do, and if it doesn't, that is going to be a failure, is actually recognize that some of the concerns that have been raised, especially by people in developing countries, including governments from developing countries, are legitimate concerns. That is the geopolitics that uh, uh, Ben was talking about, and that hasn't happened. Some of us here were observers in the working group on enhanced cooperation last week in Geneva, which is a, a multi-stakeholder working group set, on, set up within the UN to kind of discuss the future of internet governance. And it was terribly frustrating to see how it still looked as if there's only two camps of governments who say exactly the same things to each other again and again and again. By the last day, Friday morning, I thought, why am I even in this room? Like, I can make all the arguments both for Sweden and for Saudi Arabia. <laughs> it, I mean, on every single paragraph, you know exactly which words they were going to, to uh, uh, want to change, what the proposed change would be, etc. It was a complete stalemate. Like this, we are not going to move. And then I do think that the ITU meeting, the plan potentially in November, is going to become a real, real challenge. So I think either the Western governments uh, and possibly also businesses are going to recognize that some of these issues are real problems and something has to move. And once that happens, then we can start talking about, okay, what is the best mechanism? Which is not, as far as I'm concerned, the proposals of Saudi Arabia or Iran or Russia or for that matter, matter unfortunately, India. But there are elements in those proposals which try to address those concerns that they have, and which have value. So let's start looking at these things. And for me, that would be the success. Just putting the recognition on the map, and then we can move. And since the Working Group on Enhanced Cooperation is now going to have another meeting in May, because there was no report to be written clearly after last week, this uh, Brazil is going to be really important in setting the tone for that report as well. If that's the recognitions are on the table in Brazil, then the main meeting of the Working Group is going to be a very different meeting. I just wanted to address some points that uh, Ben raised on bringing new faces and new people to the debate. I think it's it's a gradual process in, in the fact that, uh, at least in Brazil, the president was talking about internet governance. Mm -hmm. it, it really changed it a lot within Brazilian civil society that wasn't in, in, in the field, you know? So we, we were in Dubai and we were there like, nobody, were paying too much attention on it. And then after that speech, after the, the, the announcement of the event, more people, even from colleagues from the region, got more interested in the topic. Colleagues that uh, were focused mostly on national policies. So it's a start. And also, uh, Brazil, is, is try, the organization is trying to have uh, bring the experiences that we had on public uh, participation using platforms to, to foster the debate. And so other contributions are online, everybody can read it. 
there will be some efforts to implement other tools for commenting in the platform and remote participation. I know that uh, the Web We Want campaign is planning uh, some activities to, to bring uh, regular users of the internet to debate the, the topic, the principles, and also the, the presidency will be uh, doing like things like Rio Plus 20 for, for people to, to start to pay attention. I know it's very complicated, we, we had to do this mapping to know where we were in one of those meetings and what is connected to what and and why we were in, in the room, you know. So it's it's complicated, but I think it's a gradual process and the situation, situation is changing uh, slowly. And I'm curious also about what other things, uh, what would be a success at, uh, for the meeting. I also got very preoccupied being at the working group on enhanced cooperation and seeing that this will pretty much be the same people that will be in Brazil. So how things will be different from that? I think that's a great point. I mean, it's it's very frustrating to sit in these meetings with governments who've been recycling the same arguments over and over again, and you don't really see the connection to users. So it's exciting to see that what we want and other projects are trying to actually bring in the users and why are we actually doing this? You know, the internet is a tool for human rights, and so often we get caught in very obscure, abstract arguments. Um, I did see some questions from the audience. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone running the mic, so. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sergio. Uh, I'm a student here, but I'm also, uh, I also have a background from the Brazilian government. I work for the telecom regulator there. Mostly I follow this uh, track of the IT. And I, uh, well, I, I don't get if this meeting is not about the ICANN. Uh, the reason, it, it was uh, proposed by ICANN. That is the reason. <coughs> we have a video of that, uh, an interview of Fadi Shahadi the day that, that he met with Dilma. Uh, very proudly announcing that uh, this will be a meeting about ICANN. And one of the reasons of it is the globalization of, uh, of ICANN, which I still do not understand. What is, what is the glo globalization of what? Uh, also, I don't, know, I don't know yet if it is the IANA functions. I don't know. I, I, I'm not following it. I, I don't see it. And one of the, um, I, I very much like this, this work that Joanna and other people did with this mapping, because another thing that, would, that is not there which is not there anymore. It is like the WTDC, but there was also the WSIS plus 10 meeting. That was the game. That was the move again. At least from my reading, I might be wrong, but my reading when that when the announcement of this meeting to, uh, happened was to deviate attention from the ITU track and the meeting of WSIS plus 10 that was happening in April, which is now not there anymore. So um, it's just something like, this is about ICANN, this has to be about ICANN, otherwise it's just a little, it's an infinite loop. My question is a follow-on from that, I, yeah. um, Hi, thank you so much, great panel. Um, Felicity Ruby is my name and I work for ThoughtWorks. And um, I've been around a lot of international campaigns before and I feel like the actions of Brazil are a little bit similar to those of Canada uh, in the landmines process a very stuck intergovernmental process taken outside of the UN, catalyzing a whole lot of new voices and ideas that was then brought back in for kind of ratification and codification. It's a very, very creative process and I think it's very exciting what Brazil is doing and the potentials that you've outlined. Um, it seemed, if my reading of the matter is a little bit different to yours in terms of um, ICANN and the Montevideo statement really putting this issue of the globalization of ICANN front and center. And I was just wondering if the panel had any comments on what the most ambitious vision of that could be. ICANN itself has said it might be time to move out of home, um, the home being this country. What's the most ambitious vision that we could have about its genuine internationalization or globalization? Thanks. Um, <coughs> my name is Linda. Uh, I recall being in Dubai all through the wicked times and almost having to walk home that Friday because we didn't know that all the metro were closed. <laughs> Alright, that's by the way. I, I recall also writing the, the basic document for the Africa IG from my kitchen. 
Lakini ni flight to Dar es Salaam to go and knock on doors at the African Union and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa saying, so, hey guys, this is something that needs to be done, you know. And now it's coming on. I, I want to come back to capacity building and especially Sweden when it says, I actually did tweet that, that there is no M Swedish embassy that is not aware of the IG issue. And that I want to say salute because it is incredible for a tiny country, okay, tiny, okay, tiny landmass, if I should say, <laughs> as we did to pull that off. And I was at the Stockholm Internet Forum last, last year, and there were more Africans in, our, in Stockholm for the uh, Stockholm Internet Forum than there were in the Africa Internet Governance Forum itself in Nairobi. Uh, that's one end. On the other end, we started what we call the Africa School of, of Internet Governance with APC and some other organizations uh, trying to bring in fresh blood because in as much as we are sitting here, you said it's the same old people we've grown, I've been on it now for 14 years and my, I've started growing gray, I've grown wiser and wider on this same issue. Now the question is how do we bring new people, how do we um, reinforce capacities of the government <coughs> at the level that Sweden is doing it, and civil society, academia, and all across. And, and don't think that this is what Brazil can do. The, the 248 hour meeting is not going to do that. It's still coming back to us. And I don't even think that the IGF, the way it stands at the moment, is doing that. It still has to come back to somebody somewhere having to sit down over at least three, four, five, six days, if not two weeks, to explain what is the name, what is the internet government, who are the actors involved, what is like uh, Deborah was tweeting, what is governance of the internet, what is governance on the internet, what are the issues today, what will be the issues tomorrow, and where do you need to come in? And that takes a lot of energy. Where do we find the resources for that? Thank you. So I think maybe we'll, if there's more questions, we'll stop here and put some of those to the panel. There was a question on um, ICANN and what are the different proposals. There's a question on capacity building. And maybe to draw a few of the questions together, this whole Brazil meeting could also be a distraction from the WISIS and the other meetings. And in terms of capacity building, you know, civil society only has so many resources. Governments, small and large, only have so many resources. So some of, maybe some of the panelists can respond to that. Just one point of clarification on the WISIS meeting in April that was actually delayed because we made no progress in the in one of the different WISIS review processes that the ICU is facilitating and completing that with some um, events in Egypt, um, political events that would make it impossible to hold a meeting there in April. So there's there's the you know the circumstances, but also the larger picture. Just to um, very briefly respond to several points. Um, so I think that it's it's very hopeful that um, the answers to these questions are not being made by the people on the panel, but by the people in the room. Partially because um, we spent a lot of time struggling on the gender balance on this panel, and just about managed to make 50-50. It was originally more women than men on this panel. But honestly, the, when, when the Brazilian president makes a statement like this, she's essentially calling out the bullshit that exists. And the acknowledgement, as Anya was saying already, by both businesses and governments in Europe and North America of the existing bullshit is a necessary condition for the process to move forward. Until that happens, we're just stuck in a stalemate and it's not going to develop. But also, when Deborah asks me, as a white man who's half British, half German, to be making a, an answer about what the legitimacy question is, I am not the right person to be answering that question. It shouldn't be me. I'm already one of the usual suspects. I've been having these conversations far too long, and I, I have the wrong demographic elements to be able to answer that question legitimately. There are plenty of other people in the room who might be able to answer that better. But I think the, the role for us white men sitting on these panels is to create a space that other people can answer those questions rather than giving the clever responses that we have that will somehow solve the problems. So yeah, and, and one way of creating uh, such uh, spaces by, by uh, white man is perhaps the, the Stockholm Internet Forum. So thank you, Nana, for, for, that, uh, for that comment. That was really, uh, really nice to hear. Um, that is one way of creating a, a conversation or a dialogue that includes um, 
people that are normally not not well. Um, so we, we totally agree with, with the uh, with the complaints and the concerns that are raised by, by many countries around the world, um, and increasingly so, and, and they have a right to do so. So the forum in Stockholm is just a very small contribution to trying to strengthen the dialogue uh, with the help of our partners at CEDA, uh, of course. Um, I wanted to comment on, on, on uh, the negotiations in, uh, in, uh, in Geneva as well. Uh, I, think, uh, I think you're quite, you're quite right, of course. Um, you were there and you participated very, very ambitiously and, and all of that. But I think it's, it's also important that it's, it's not, we, don't, we don't do this just because. Um, in, in our mind, uh, some of our opponents here they belong to some of the worst offenders of human rights we have in the world, um, basically. It's, uh, it's the Iran, it's the China, it's the Saudi Arabia, it's Russia. We would, we would not propose a model which would give them greater influence over how to run the internet. I think this is, this is basically uh, where we're coming from. Um, and I, I wouldn't really agree that we are completely inflexible. We have, um, we have discussed several ways of, of strengthening the IGF, for example. Um, we are, we're very open to discussion on, on how to strengthen the ICANN. Um, so, uh, I, I see uh, I, your point is valid, but just to give this a little bit of, of, of uh, nuance, uh, which I think is, is useful. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. On the question of on the question of ICANN and, and, and this particular meeting in Brazil, I, I know it's you know in my case very easy to conflate a lot of the things. There's so many things going on, and ICANN has been a, a very active steward in the space recently, and so it's it's sort of sometimes difficult. Uh, I know in my organization with my colleagues, even sort out what the you know what's happening when. And if you sort of zoom out and look at this from a global perspective, it must be even harder. Uh, the the globalization of ICANN is a really important topic and one that needs to be addressed. There was a, a panel that was convened, one of the uh, projects that, that Fadi initiated, uh, that, that looks at that issue. And it just published a report that, that's been out now for a couple of weeks that I think is worth looking at um, because it provides, Serge, I think a, a little bit of, a, of some, some vision in terms of the history of the evolution of the internet, how it's been slowly released from a, an American project into the, into the global community, uh, and some proposals on how that might continue to evolve. Uh, one of them is, for example, this idea of a web of affirmation of commitments. Uh, the affirmation of commitments is, a, is currently a uh, construct between the United States government and ICANN, but that, that report talks about the suggestion of maybe opening that up and saying that the affirmation of commitments might not be something that could be exclusively limited to the United States government. It could be other, other governments involved. That, of course, raises other questions of accountability and how do you deal with recourse. There are a lot of open issues that need to be addressed in this, in this, uh, in this problem. And, I, and, and, it's, and it's something that we should continue to address. But again, when we talked earlier about defining success or failure of this meeting in Brazil, um, my concern is that if we think about this in terms of ICANN, it's not on the agenda. And so if we worry about that issue being in Brazil, particularly since it's not on the agenda, we're going into an event that's going to fail. And I don't think that's good for any of us. So uh, it's something to think about, and it's a problem that we need to address just in the right context. The uh, second point on, on Nana's question about capacity building is one that I think is really important. Uh, this was one of the biggest failures coming out of Brazil, was, <laughs> if I may say, the arrogance of the, of the private sector and of the Western world, and taking the issues that were very real for, for the emerging world, Spam, for example, and just saying, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. This is not something that, that needs to be worried. We're going to go on to other things that are more, are more important. I'm, over, I'm overstating it, but that's certainly how it felt. And that's not a very satisfying answer. Um, so what is the answer? Uh, part of it is capacity building. These, these events like the, uh, like the summer school in Africa is good. But I also was very impressed by a recent video that I heard from Dee Quaino at, the, at the Apricot. Uh, it, was a short, it was a short recording, and you can look it up on, on April, about two minutes long. He has a really interesting presentation about how, in order to address these, the issues that affect the emerging, emerging market, in his case, Africa, it's really important to focus energy locally. 
if all of the resources, there aren't that many resources, right, that are, that are engaged in this space, but if they're all flying around the globe dealing with global issues, then the local issues aren't being addressed. And one of the most fundamental things that needs to be addressed in a lot of these growing markets is just getting the internet to people and figuring out how to get connectivity there. And so hopefully we can, we can figure out a way to, to develop capacity building in a way that, that um, does not detract from these very limited resources on a global stage trying to solve problems on a global level, when really a lot of them can be solved sort of regionally and just sort of dealing with it in a very practical way. Just um, <coughs> one comment on, on the part of ICO. Uh, I think it is in the agenda. It's going to be debated under the, the discussions about the roadmap. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, discussion of all the institutions uh, that deal with internet governance and, and so it's going to be included. And as it was a meeting that was proposed by Fadi as well, uh, I think they pretty much have a plan <laughs> on that and we'll bring it to Brazil, so I wouldn't remove it from the table. Uh, just very briefly to respond to Johan and indirectly to some of the questions. Um, I think all governments in the meeting had shown some flexibility. That was actually true of both sides also. Um, but perhaps it, what we really need is to kind of not discuss so much the concrete proposals already, but actually to take a slight step back and look again at what are the underlying concerns and what are the alternative ways in which these can be addressed. And for example, strengthening the IGF now, frankly speaking, that's too little too late. Like if that would have been agreed to five years ago, that would have been fabulous. Um, but now that's just not enough. Um, and I think, I mean, you have to take into account the, this history. In the working group, another thing that was done was a really useful exercise. There was a correspondence group that actually tried to map where issues are already being addressed. So they collected lots of input. That exercise wasn't finished. But for example, a more substantive discussion of that exercise in the meeting would have been really valuable, I think, to kind of perhaps refocus the, com the conversation a little bit. There's nobody specifically to blame that that didn't happen. And I think there was also a recognition at the end of the meeting that it was a pity that didn't happen. But I think that kind of work is really important. And it also helps with the kind of questions that Nana was asking. If we have, for example, a new body that will look at gaps and where those can be taken forward. A substantial part of its work could be this ongoing mapping exercise, but also then documenting these processes and making that information publicly available so that everybody who either wants to get involved in some way or has an issue actually knows where to go to ask, so where exactly do we need to go with this one? And at the moment, that's completely absent. And I think that's one of the big challenges for capacity building. Also. In gen another thing that really struck me in the working group, and it's again one of the weaknesses of multi-stakeholderism, there were fantastic contributions made by people also from civil society who already have capacity in, the, in response to a questionnaire which they sent out in, in the summer, in July, August. And uh, in the discussions in the working group last week when it came down to recommendations, the only inputs that really were on the table were inputs that could be represented by a person who was present in that room. So if some of the, the proposals that we made as civil society were actually discussed there, it is because some of us were there to kind of say, we really want this to be on the agenda. We have text, you please take this into account. And then they immediately said yes. But it really made me conscious of all the people who made the fantastic work and didn't have the resources to be in that room to actually make the point and say, we want this to be discussed which is also, I think, one of the values of Brazil, that hopefully it, there will be a broader group. So more of these alternative proposals that can help reshape the debate a little bit will actually get attention, which I think they haven't had sufficiently. On ICANN, unfortunately, I don't have, like, uh, I'm not able to answer the question because I don't feel that we have that perfect vision yet. There's also, a, I would love to see more research done, for example, even on things like the role of the GAC in ICANN right now. Um, because I, can, I, I, I think there is a lot of value in the ICANN model, but for example, the whole uh, controversy of on the round dot Amazon, the new GTLD, it wasn't picked up by the processes within ICANN. It is the gag that said, wait a minute, 
maybe the, like some countries do have a real issue with it, and I think that's legitimate that they raise that question. Which then again raises the question about, so what role should governments have in that system, even within ICANN? And even though I think the ICANN model should not be completely overhauled, um, I think we need more information about the exact role that governments already have in the system, how that works, to be able to really come up with that vision where we say, this is what supports um, an internet for social justice and human rights. Thank you. My name is Alejandro Pesanti from the National University of Mexico, the Internet Society chapter in Mexico. Brief comment. I think there's a, a real need, and it has been shown again, uh, for this debate about internet governance to be very deeply and well informed. Uh, there is no top-down structure right now uh, which has decided to be multi-stakeholder. The multi-stakeholder model, as we know, it was built up from the ground trying to solve specific problems with different regions with a very intense and totally unexpected participation of civil society worldwide, particularly from developing countries. Uh, had internet governance gone along that traditional multilateral way, uh, the internet wouldn't exist. And certainly people in communities in developing countries in uh, almost uh, illiterate or extremely poor conditions or their serious human rights challenges just would not have come together. And that's a model these people built. We built that model together with corporations and governments and everybody else. That's a fundamental understanding. It's our model. We have to be very careful what we do to it because it, the first ones to suffer damage will be ourselves. And we should be careful, I will say this in a very dramatic way. We should be careful not to be breaking the rope with which the governments or intergovernmental organizations will eventually hand us when we hand them uh, more control uh, because we will be yielding control from civil society. It's not from corporate or anyone else that will be taken away. Uh, that said, I think that human rights issues are evaporating from this discussion. Uh, the spark for President Rousseff's speech was surveillance, uh, intervention of communications. And I hope someone in the panel has an answer to how that issue will improve uh, with, you know, with some logical causation from uh, what you expect from the, from the meeting and so on. Thank you, Alejandro. I think there's a, a few more questions on the side, so maybe we can do one more round and then um, some closing remarks from the panelists based on the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicolas Sela from the Internet Society. Um, so regarding the, the future of the IGF and this question of whether or not we need you know, new, new arrangements in the future, um, I fully agree with one of Anya's points that um, we actually really need to do a good mapping exercise and to see you know, where are the gaps. Um, because the fact is, so many of these discussions are so political. Um, to react to, to Patrick's point, uh, for many people in Dubai, um, and many people came back traumatized uh, with the square brackets uh, in, their, in their heads because basically when people disagree, they put everything in square brackets. Um, and I've been in the discussions on the WISIS review process and square brackets are, are making a way back. Um, so I'm not sure there is time for, for, for a question, but uh, I think we are still at the stage where we, we do need to see where, where, where are the existing mechanisms and where are the gaps in terms of uh, participation. And, uh, from these lessons, then we can discuss you know, the next step. Do we need to make any improvements or changes? Thank you very much. Well, the Internet Governance Forum is, is something I'm definitely passionate about because I'm on the uh, multi-stakeholder advisory group. But I'm not going to cheer you for it because you're right. There is a lot of work that needs to be done. I'm not convinced. That it's uh, you know that it's obvious that it could be that could be solved and I want it to and I think we all need to work hard towards it but there are some fundamental problems one of the things that the Internet Governance Forum could do and there's an excellent proposal from the Internet Society about sort of changing it and, and providing some outcomes but also uh, one of the things that it could do for example is help be a roadmap for 
uh, four issues. In other words, rather than being a deciding mechanism when issues are brought to the, to the IGF for discussion, there could be a recommendation on where they might go for resolution, whether it be the IETF or you know, some issues are related to privacy. At the same time, the Internet Governance Forum has one employee, right? Maybe they've hired a second one right now, but the well, exactly, but it's it, it's a so there's a fundamental fundamental funding issue and a business case with the IGF that needs to be solved. Uh, we can't saddle the IGF with, with so many expectations with just one person to be able to do it. And so either we need to figure that out, or we need to figure out another way for the uh, community itself, those of us here that care about these issues, to then rise up and then volunteer to be able to address a lot of these issues that the IGF brings up. Very fundamental problem that needs to be solved, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue to, to, to work on that. So just briefly on the IGF and then on the surveillance issue, which I also think is very important. Um, so uh, the reason uh, I think Anya is right in the sense that it's like fiddling with the IGF now is almost too little too late is because it's been 10 years that the IGF and its creation has created a backlog of internet governance policy issues that haven't been resolved because the IGF existed. So in many regards, the IGF has become, not always been, but essentially become a governance prevention mechanism. It's actually stopping things going to different governance structures or alternative governance structures being created because there's a thing that opens <coughs> space for conversations, which is why I think Brazil is hopeful in a sense because it allows that at least to be challenged and say, this isn't the only show in the room, this isn't the only thing going on. In a sense, even the ITU meeting in that sense was helpful because it was challenging the singular authority of the IGF to do nothing. And this is as somebody who spent many years running an IGF dynamic coalition. So it's, it's I, I have part of my heart is with the IGF, but we have to be honest about its ability to do things. On the surveillance issues, because I think they're extremely important um, in my mind, but please feel free to disagree with me. I think there will be zero progress made on any type of surveillance issues in Brazil. And that's because we need to get our own national governments accountable on these issues, and we can't expect the global body to take that problem away from us. There is no global body that has the capacity to do that, while our own national governments are running agencies within them and paying for them with our money in ways that we don't consider acceptable. So that's to everybody in the room to go back to their own national government and uh, keep hitting them over the head so long until they do something. Right. Not metaphorically, please, not physically. <laughs> That's the, the only solution to that one. But we also shouldn't be expecting that from Net Mundial. That's not something that is reasonable to expect from an, uh, an international conference in that context. The best we can hope for is that internet governance gets a little bit less shitty. <laughs> yeah, I agree with Ben that the surveillance issue won't be addressed there. The discussions will be more high level, like every principle, but. Uh, I don't think it should be the forum to do that thing. Um, in other hand, Brazil and Germany have pushed for the approval of um, a resolution, the UN General Assembly on privacy in the digital age, and there are further steps with that resolution. Uh, reports going to be made. So there are other tracks uh, going on to, to address this issue, I guess. And, my final remark is that I hope that at least over some caipirinhas we can dilute some <laughs> square brackets and have something concrete of, out of this meeting. No, on, on the same issue uh, that Alejandro raised on surveillance, I, I think considering where, where this uh, net mundial comes from, uh, the rationale behind it, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, surveillance issues are actually discussed. Uh, and I totally agree with, with Ben that this is something that we need to go back to our, our uh, governments to sort out, sort out first. And uh, one way of doing it is to take a proactive stance. Uh, my government has tried to do that. Um, and my Minister of Foreign Affairs has pronounced a couple of very fundamental rule of law based principles to protect human rights in electronic surveillance. So that is one way. We heard an American version yesterday, uh, the US uh, announcement. These are some way of at least acknowledging that we need to abide by some kind of rules in able to, to respect human rights when we do this. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the discussions will be, of course, in, in Sao Paulo, but to me, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised, considering the, the uh, um, variety of people that are coming, and uh, uh, if, if this issue is, is somehow put on the table at, at some point. I don't have much left to add. I just wanted to thank Alejandro for that important reminder that we shouldn't create the rule with which you know, the stakeholderism is going to hang. 
because I fully agree with you. Ben earlier said uh, businesses, the technical community, civil society are the ones who get a seat on the table now and wouldn't have it otherwise. I don't agree because I think business always has a seat on the table, including in government-led processes. It's just that that seat is not all that visible. <coughs> But, but businesses are in the room. It's uh, actually civil society especially that stands to gain. And I do agree we should not throw off the baby with the bath water. But I do think we need to have the courage to really face some of the difficult questions that are being asked and address them head on and work through that. And that that will benefit all of us. Well, on that note, I think we should probably close the panel because we're a little over time. And Thank you, everyone. I'm glad we actually did manage to talk about surveillance and not let it override the entire conversation on internet governance, which isn't always easy. And um, thank you for all for coming. And if you have any more questions, I'm sure the panel will be around for the rest of the day.